So welcome everyone to this month's uh, CMX Connect chapter programs and user groups program meetup. And my name is Tari Vesilovsky. I'm a community manager at Elementor running the uh, meetup, uh, our global meetup program. And the co-host with me of this chapter is uh, Elijah, who presented himself earlier. He will be for the chat. If you will have questions for our um, panelists today, please drop them in the Q&A chat so we can answer them in the last we will see that is very important and we will interrupt. So our panelist today is uh, Laura Grandi Hill from is a community manager, uh, event and community manager from Airbase. We also have Tanya Yatskovaitska, I apologize it's for the not pronouncing. Uh, it's, she's the community um, and education manager at Marber and Madeline Uliverly, global community manager uh, at Startup Grind. Um, they will present themselves more and this is recorded. So just for your knowledge and we will share with uh, people afterwards, with the group, the chapter um, members. So we'll start with Laura. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to um, talk with all of you today. Yeah, and if you have questions, please drop them in. But I just kind of wanted to give an overview about how I'm thinking about all of this in my own community. And let me see if I can share my screen and pull this up. Can you see? Is it working? Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. So just to give you some background, I run events and community for Airbase. Airbase is a financial uh, technology software. We really wanted to create a community in order to add more value to hopefully future clients and prospects. So we made this group called Off the Ledger, which we started in January of 2020. We now have over 3,100 members. And what's been really amazing is just watching the growth and watching the members support each other. People have found jobs on there. We run networking events. I do a monthly newsletter in order to um, re-engage folks. So, and our goal with this is really to make a safe space, a place that's adding value and doing brand awareness. We And I know this is different from some other communities, but ours, we specifically made a sales free zone because we wanted it to really be a resource for these finance and accounting professionals. So those are the, our main goals, adding value, boosting awareness, and also because there are a handful of current clients, we do sometimes get product feedback in the community. And when we were creating this community originally, these were the two main points that myself and the team were thinking about. What does the community need to be successful? And what are the executives expecting? Um, so we'll talk about that. So these are the measures of success that I use for our community. Number one, how do we prove that we're adding value? I do UTM tracking on any time we're posting about any events or webinars that we're hosting. So I'm able to pull reports and see how many of the members actually click through and registered and came to the event or watched it on demand later. Absolutely, I think it's table stakes, but tracking your membership of hopefully you're getting more and more members every month. And then also tracking engagement. Are people um, asking questions? Are they having conversations? That's a great way to, again, table stakes, but it's a great way to make sure that your community is adding value. And then also for the boosting awareness part, um, and this is this one is a little tough because again, we're trying to be really not promotional in a very sales-free zone and we're so top of funnel, but we're able to do multi-touch attribution and see how many of our closed one deals involved contacts that are members of the community. So it's, it's a little finger in the wind because there's so many steps from someone joining the community to being a closed deal, but it we have found that it's a much higher likelihood of a deal closing if there are contacts at that company who are members of the community. And then what a measure of success for product feedback is by tracking how, what people are asking for, what suggestions they make for the product and any other feedback that they give me in the community. And it's basically just, I have a spreadsheet. <laughs> so 
here are, in my opinion, uh, some suggested KPIs of things to pay attention to. Again, kind of table stakes, your membership. How many new members have you acquired over the past week, month, or quarter? We've boosted our uh, membership by running some paid placements when we have budget for that. I cross-promote the community on all of our um, events and webinars that we do. And in January of 2020, before we were all locked down, I also would actually print out flyers with a QR code for the join page and hand them out when we were doing in-person events. And I've also enlisted the rest of the team. So for our sales folks, for our customer success teams, they all have just a easy little blurb they can copy paste and add into an email, or they can mention it on a call. And uh, it, it's been really helpful to get more members in by having the rest of the team be enabled to make those invites. So then engagement. So are your members connecting, chatting, and engaging? So again, I'm using UTM code to track webinar and event signups. I, my community is run on Slack right now. So there are some analytics that Slack has that you can see how many uh, monthly messages people are posting, both public and direct messages. And also a way that I find um, helps engagement is for the community members that are really involved and respond to questions or ask really great questions, I try to empower them and I will reach out and suggest, hey, this is a great question. Do you want to run a poll? Do you want to host a roundtable about this? And I try to give the engaged members more ownership because I find it'll, it helps them be even more involved. And then multi-touch attribution, final KPI I would suggest. So again, in my situation where the community is such a top of funnel thing that it's hard to uh, prove ROI directly, but using multi-touch attributions, I can see the community's influence on our uh, closed deals. I've also uh, heard from our sales folks and our customer success folks that there's a lot of word of mouth that, that members are recommending other of people in their network. And we can also track this in Salesforce, which is we use Marketo and Salesforce on our tech stack. And then, so here's a sort of self-check you could do to see if you're on the right track. Some, again, some basic stuff. Do you have a steady stream of new members? Are there consistent conversations? For my community, because it's finance, it's usually really quiet the first week of the month, so which is like this week, because everybody's doing their monthly close of the books, but then everyone will come back in the later weeks. Also, if you have community members who stay with you, even as their career grows and they have new jobs, and then also are members referring folks in their network, maybe the rest of their team, colleagues, and other folks that they know, if you're getting referrals, you're definitely doing a good job. And just to see there's just some quotes, this is what people have messaged me. And I just think it's, it's really gratifying that people have gotten a lot of good information and found that the community is such a good resource, which is absolutely one of the goals that we're going to. So that's me. I'm going to stop my screen share. And uh, I'll hand it back to Tali. Thank you. Does anyone have any specific to Laura? No. So I will ask a question that me and Tali uh, talked about, about the multi-touch attribution. Mm -hmm. So who is like, okay, so you mentioned you have Slack, you're using Slack as your community mm -hmm. space and you're using Salesforce and Mercado as your mm -hmm. um, other uh, marketing and business tools. Yep. Does it, is it connected and who is deciding who knows and connect, you know, connecting the, the dots of the people that are in the community yeah. and the ones that are you're closing deals with? Yeah, we, so we also use Tableau to help visualize that as well and pulling reports. I don't actually pull any of the reports. That's that we have a operations person on the team who's able to do that, but we're really maniacal about making sure we always have a Salesforce campaign for everything so that you can click into a contact and you can see literally everything that they've done, whether they downloaded a white paper or joined the community or whatever. And so our ops person is able, because of the very large number of Salesforce campaigns we have, they're able to run a report on closed deals and then pull the community member numbers. And we can see that. <laughs> I say it's very interesting and I'm sure that, that we will have a question in the end. I don't want to answer. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to Tanya. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, great. Unfortunately, I don't have the slides to share. I don't know how did this happened. I'm a big fan of infographics and slides uh, and all the presentations, but I wasn't prepared to this call. I thought that will be uh, a conversation. Just uh, so I just will speak about what we do at SmartBear, and if you have any questions, just uh, ask them in the Q&A section. So let me start with uh, who I am and where I'm from. Uh, so as uh, Tala said, my name is Tatiana Yuskovska and this surname, I know it's extremely difficult to pronounce and thanks to my husband, my original surname was much better to pronounce. I started working at Smartware 13 years ago. It's just the time when I graduated from the university and I'm with the Smartware since that time. At SmartBear, we uh, provide, we develop applications to provide our customers software that they can use uh, for the different software application lifecycle, for the development, for testing purposes, for maintaining the applications. We have many office, offices around the world with uh, a very strong number of customers. As I said, I'm in the SmartBear for 13 years and I'm very lucky because since within this time, I was able to grow professionally and was able to change position to find um, like the niche uh, where I belong. And uh, around eight years ago, I found uh, the community area. And uh, since that time, Smart Bay community is my life. And uh, my coworkers can say for sure that everything that I'm talking, it's only about the Smart Bay community and my thoughts is only about it. <laughs> So what we have in the our current conversation is mostly about the goals for this year and in the Smart Bay community what we are doing is first of all we are we try to measure first of all the current state where we are what we are doing we are measuring a lot of stats community members uh, mem member stats activity stats like contribution stats how many topics how many people are participating in one topic all of these help us understand better the community persona so we know for sure who our community member is, where this person come to us, to the community, like in what uh, time period, within a day and even a day. And uh, this allows us to communicate with the community members more efficiently because we know, for example, when it's better to post any news to the community, how to better address to this or that audience, maybe to different countries. In the SmartBear community, we have around 20 products and it's a challenge for us because all of these 20 products, they are located under one umbrella under the SmartBear community. And you may imagine that customers of different products may be different. They can be located in different countries. They may be passionate about different industries. And that's why we need to be very like active and maybe sometimes even proactive in order to better identify the needed, like the needed touch, how to touch the, the these or that uh, community more, more, more effectively. So, the, as I said, we know the community persona, we know who this person, and definitely this helps us identify what this person wants from the community. And depends on these wants, we are uh, setting up our goals. In, for many years, uh, we, uh, we were working on identifying KPIs, so we measured stats the previous years, we identified how many community members came to us, we knew which growth we can expect and if we wanted to improve these or that kpi we worked on changing some structure maybe of the community or maybe the ui of the community running different community programs and definitely this affected this specific kpi so it means that all of our goals they are we, we, we track them very careful by the stats so to better understand the effectiveness of the changes that we are doing. And also depending on the goals, it's, it, it also depends a lot about, it also depends a lot on the place where the community is at the moment. So for many years, the Smart Bay community belonged to the support team. And so that's why huge efforts we spent on the case deflection metrics. So it's, uh, we considered, and we consider even at the moment, we consider the smart way community as a great way where customers can resolve their questions without asking the help and the, the 
with, without submitting a support ticket. And the community platform, we use a course, which is, was lithium course, all, all stuff. They help us measure these uh, case deflection metrics by uh, allowing us to post solutions to the questions. And this was a great KPI for us for many years. At the moment, the Smart Bay community moved to the marketing team and the goals of the community has been changed a bit. We started mostly working on the uh, customer engagement and uh, identifying the like community mood and improve this level of the conversation among community members. So at the moment, we're very passionate about the customer community, community member engagement. We track a lot. The one of the key metrics is number of active members comparison with the number of contributors, right? Because we see that, for example, active members are people who sign in to the community and uh, contributors, it's people who created a post, at least one post to the community. And the interesting thing is that for us, for example, we are open community. Each of our conversation is possible to read and you will need to sign in into your community account only if you want to give, we call it kudos, or if you want to post something. And what we see at the moment is that, for example, this level of active people uh, who sign in, it's much, much higher in comparison with people who contributed to the community by creating a post. And uh, this is a great um, interest for us for this year in order to identify uh, why people are signing into the community without posting anything, because we would like to help them to post because def definitely people have something to share and we just need to maybe allow them to do this because sometimes for our customers, it's like a challenge to overcome to start posting because they, they are afraid that their questions may not, their questions is like simple and they uh, will answer or will ask by someone else. So it's also to break this barrier to help customers to join. And also the thing that I wanted to mention, this is like a key elements of all these goals and objective, ob objectives for the year is that you need to carefully track what is happening with the with your metrics with your kpi and we found that it's extremely great to have community dashboard right and this community dashboard should be available to stakeholders and it should be like vp level or even higher because these dashboards should like show the the importance of the community because sometimes community is like a small part in, inside the entire organization we are not developing anything it's not our like software uh, um, developers who are very important and who are developing a lot of new features for us we are just a small customer resource not a small customer resource but it's a, still a customer resource that we need always to give stakeholders be aware about us and having these uh, community dashboards on the stakeholders level it's that, that it was extremely good for us we started seeing the interest from this level of our people and we started getting more resources because we have many ideas that we would like to do and uh, it helped us even grow it helped us get even bigger kpi that uh, we expected and also the most important thing, so I said about tracking uh, the, key, the metrics and for us, we have different type of dashboards for different levels, for different um, level of uh, people. For us, for community managers and for people who work with the community, we have some daily data or even daily and weekly data. And it helps us react as fast as possible to any changes that we see in the community. But definitely for stakeholders, we are doing monthly or even quarterly dashboards uh, so that they can see a clear picture of what is happening in the community for some certain duration. And of course, we are including the community into the customer workflow. It depends on how you work in your organization with the customers. We have a great possibility to include the community inside the product. And this is a huge help for us because we, we, just imagine when you are inside the product, you have some, and you are alone in the product, you have some questions and, and you can resolve it just 
by finding the the answers uh, to similar questions in the community. So it's we are very proactive in this case because a person, a customer, just do not need to know where to go in order to find the answer to the question. We already uh, have all the resources, have all the links to him, to her, where it is possible to find these the answer to the questions that they may have. Yep. Okay. So, yes, I, I mentioned most of the stuff that I wanted. If you have any questions. So we, we do have some questions, actually. I will take one or two now, and then we will have the rest after Madeline talk. So one of the questions is from Laurie. Uh, no, so a question from uh, Ma uh, Maria. How you mentioned interaction, that you're following up with interactions between members on the forum. Maria asked, how do you follow up on these interactions? Do you mean to active people, right, who sign in? Yeah, you, sorry. You mentioned that you were following up all the interactions, notes from your interactions with some of the users to have a history of how they joined. It was at the very beginning of your conversation to be able to share it with other parts of your organization. So I was wondering what tool do you use to track those interactions so it is visible, all that history and the, all that not hard data for others to, to use as well, to have as insight. I suppose it's mostly about the like community persona and uh, how we better understand. It's it goes from different places. It's uh, Google Analytics. It is course data that we have, and plus again Google Anal Analytics, but uh, not all over the community side, but their uh, connection among other our our sites like direct uh, traffic from which resources uh, we are getting these. Uh, referrals right at the moment we have a lot of the organic traffic not all of them are very relevant and that's why we track a lot of the direct traffic the referral traffic from our own web websites because we have several of them and we know from which exactly a person came to the community thank you Great. So before uh, there are more questions for uh, Tanya, which are a bit more general. So let's go to Madeline and then we'll have like open Q and A until the end. Sounds great. Thanks. Perfect. Hi everyone. My name is Madeline. Super happy to be here. Thank you, Tali and Eli for the invite. It actually happened to be one of my personal goals this year to connect more with community managers. So this works out perfectly. And if anyone wants to meet for like virtual coffee or something like that later, I'll drop my LinkedIn or email and, and we can connect. But I will share a little bit of background about myself and Startup Grind. Startup Grind is the world's largest community of entrepreneurs, founders, innovators, and creators around the world. We host thousands of events, but more importantly, we're all about being a community and we bring like-minded yet individuals together to connect, learn, teach, help, and build their startups. And so we do this through local events, flagship conferences, our startup program, and different content and, and media production. And we have over 3.5 million members in our community that we've reached. So where my journey begins with Startup Grind, I actually started as a attendee back at the Phoenix chapter all the way back in 2016. Then I moved to Chicago in 2017, and I started becoming an attendee there because uh, I knew they were a global org. And I absolutely loved what it was all about. I then moved into a co-director role for the Chicago chapter, where as a volunteer that helped put on these local events for the community. And then it was in 2019 that I was asked to join the HQ team full-time at Startup Brian as community manager of the Americas. And now I serve as our global community manager overseeing all of our chapters. So high level where we start out is all of the goals for us come from our team. It doesn't come from like management or the other programs or products. It really is our own internal chapter director program. And so the two things that we really look for are, you know, hosting local events and that chapter activity. And so we consider chapters that are active and that are hosting events and meeting their minimum event requirements as an active chapter. 
And so currently we're at over 500 chapters across 125 countries. We have our team divided by region and have a community manager that specifically oversees and supports each region. So at the beginning of every year, we have an internal goal setting meeting. And so some of the different tools and and things that we look at when setting these uh, yearly goals is we have an end of year director survey that we send out to our community members. And so we really just try to get their feedback and hear about what they need to not only host better events to make their experience as a chapter director journey better and each year we're always looking to improve and really our goals come from the community and and what they're looking for and how we can serve them and just make their jobs a little bit easier as volunteer organizers once we put out that survey we give like about a month um for uh, them to respond. And then we review that as a team. We pull out all the key shortcomings that they highlighted and all the areas for improvement. And one of the first steps that we take in creating our strategy then for the year is, is setting our goals. And so we come up with a goal statement to focus on. And then we come up with KPIs that are associated with that goal. So in this goal setting meeting, we'll brainstorm keywords that we want our community to embody and what we really want our community and programs to look like that year. And then we get to rank them as a team and then brainstorm a mission statement from there that really influences our goals. And then from there, we like implement create those goals and those strategies from there. So some of like the main goals that we have is that chapter activity and our chapter directors meeting their minimum event requirements and engaging there. So for us, we create a bit of a stretch goal, which is like 80% chapter activity for us, especially with the pandemic. We have seen those numbers change because first of all, these individuals are volunteers. So they've had a lot of other crazy stuff go on in their life. And then secondly, just with the transition of like virtual and then all the different COVID policies, we have had to have some like shifts there. So our realistic goal is hitting that 50% of chapter activity, but we always aim for that 80%. And then we also look at internal director event attendance. So we do capture that in like a Google sheet. And every month we host like office hours events. We have a quarterly town hall with our CEO and founder, Derek Anderson. And so we measure the activity of, hey, are chapters directors actually interested in being a part of the global community and not just like super focused on on the ground, on their local communities? And are they engaging with other chapter directors there? We also have a goal around sponsorship and our our team bringing in some chapter revenue. And then we also set community program goals, which I'll talk about a little bit later, some of our community programs. And then we also support the other teams. So we have a global conference every year. And then we also have a startup program that we work on referrals for through our director community. So after we establish those main goals, we then break it up into our quarterly goals. And so First, when it comes to the chapter activity, we look at increasing event numbers, setting a a goal for that. And this is like a prime example of having to pivot your approach when you set a goal and maybe it's not working out. So we we have this target of 80% chapter activity. And typically in the past, we would just send out communications asking chapters why they're not hosting, if they're not meeting the requirements, like what challenges are they facing? And we were seeing a lot of chapters just having to take a break because they weren't allowed to host or things like that. And so it was really affecting our KPI numbers because we it was like we had all these inactive chapters, but they were still playing a role in our numbers when they actually like weren't even going to be active at all and wanted to step down. And so we changed our approach and really now wanted to focus on -on one-on-one interactions. And so this is like a new goal that has stemmed out. And so 
we are looking to do individual chapter check-ins. And as a team, we try to do a hundred a month. And we capture those calls and monitor all the feedback in a dashboard with an air table that we created. And then we're also easily able to then follow up with those chapter directors on the events that they're hosting by setting like a deadline of when they're going to, to hit that event hosted. And then a specific uh, example of a community program that we have is our cohort training program. So in the past, anytime that someone wanted to launch a chapter within their city, quick water break, one second. Anytime they wanted to launch a chapter within their city, they would fill out an application form. We would review it as a team. We'd interview them, discuss it, and then they'd go through the entire onboarding uh, process. And we had an internal directory of like content that was like a training manual. And then we soon realized that first, our team was way too lean to handle the amount of applications that we had been receiving. And it, it became disruptive in our day because we'd randomly be taking all of these interviews and having to do the onboarding. And so as we were scaling as a community, we wanted to think about like, how can we scale this training and ensure that events doesn't matter what city they're being hosted in, as long as they have like the startup grind brand name, like we can ensure that it's going to be a great event and is like in alignment with our, our brand. So I always joke around that Startup Grind is like a McDonald's. If you go to the McDonald's in France, it's going to have a completely different menu than the McDonald's in Chicago, but you can always count on seeing like those golden arches that you're going to be able to like make a friend there and you know what it's about, but the speaker might be a little bit different. The, the format of the networking and connecting could be different etc. So back to scaling this community program, we really, this goal derived from like a, a problem and this pain point of, okay, how can we scale these events at hand? We then developed this cohort training program. So we do it two times a year. We have the applications that continue to come out through the year. We then start with the interviews and we just knock those all out in one to two weeks. And then from there, we'll go through the entire like onboarding process. And then we begin our cohort training program. And some of our goals out of that is really for a chapter director to host their first event by the end of the six weeks with us supporting them throughout that journey. So each week we have uh, one uh, webinars hosted across different time zones. We'll run through a little bit of the content, but really it's mostly Q&A opportunity for directors to connect. But we set four parameters for that. So the first is attend four out of the six webinar calls. Then we have a learning de development like platform with all of the content. And so you have to complete the learning deliverables. We use a platform called Meatball to facilitate one-on-one -on -one connections. And they have to attend at least meet one other chapter director on that platform. And then to have their first event hosted by the end of the six weeks. And so those are like the goals we set for our chapter directors. And then we're able to look at the data at the end of it and see if it was like an effective program. And we actually have, we've now have done this for, we've had five cohorts so far. And we actually have at the end of the month reviewing how it has been over the past five cohorts, looking at all of the data and then deciding if it still makes sense to continue with this like hybrid model or if we should move it to a different format and like continue to improve upon that goal and that program. And yeah, that's how we start from high level to community program. Wow, uh, I'm really looking for next time for the slides because it's so much information and just really something that sounds like you're doing an amazing job. From what I know also from outside, not just from, from your talk and a lot of the absorb and learn. So thank you very much for sharing. We do have a lot of questions and also comments on the chat so you can take a look do you want yeah <laughs> on the onboarding it's amazing that you are still doing the interviews so we will go to the q a before that i have a general question uh, for um all the panelists 
So when you're setting your goals, do you use a specific like a method or um, a model to, uh, to go setting or it's just or not? It's funny because before this call, I was like, what are some of our like methodologies and, and whatnot? And I spoke with our head of community and we actually don't like we don't have any specific systems or like smart goals. It's not something that we like we do that, but it's not something that's really discussed as a, a team. It's more so we focus on what is the keywords we want this community to embody and really focusing on like that mission statement that we have. Cool. I'll go next. Um, so since my program is much smaller than Madeline's global program, and we're still a small series, a startup, we do have um, specific goals. We'll have the target goal and then a stretch goal, and it is based on historic growth and then also dependent on how much budget we get to, to do advertising and help grow the program. But, uh, but yeah, so we do have try to hit specific membership goals and, and specific uh, attendance rates on webinars and events from that. Yeah. So based historically, and then also pumped up if we get more budget, which we're actually figuring out right now. So hopefully fingers crossed budget. <laughs> we're holding uh, Tanya. Budget, budget is everything, right? <laughs> Yeah, so we, all the goals, all the metrics that we're doing, it's also based on the historic data. And I mentioned on the presentation that we know for sure that we can expect this growth in, if, if we take a look at the years before. And we know for sure if we want to change something, change some metric, definitely it's uh, worth on, it's worth um working close on one or maybe two keep your eyes that you have and uh, within a year and just to concentrate on only one to two keep your eyes and identify what should be changed and each change like next to each change just set the expected growth that you have what you expect to get and when you get some numbers you can inspect if you, you can compare if these numbers of growth is what you expected or not. If it's higher than expected, it's good. But for me, it's not. For me, it's uh, the, the growth is not always good, and I would I would like to have even bigger growth. And think about uh, what else and what more can be done. Voting the questions on the Q and A is really helpful. So Kat Jarvis has um, two questions. Uh, Kat, are you with us? No, like he's not with camera. No, you're here. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I think you addressed my first one. I was curious about in in looking at past years, do you do a certain percentage? If you were seeing that your growth year over year was whatever number it was, do you say, hey, our goal is going to be 10% of that for this year? Does anyone use a particular percentage? Do you mean anyone? some specific I... numbers just to, to have the numbers in the goal? Yeah, and you did touch on it. I didn't hear anyone specifically say that you used, like, maybe if you were seeing the growth year over year of your user groups, I didn't hear anyone say you use, like, a, a specific percentage of that, like, to determine how much growth you expect for 2022, for instance. And I was curious if anyone used, used something like that. Like, how do you determine, based on looking at past growth, what you expect for the year? For us, it's more, I don't know that we've ever attached a percentage to it, but it's been more like a, of a ratio is trying to model out the existing trend and then, and then boosting it depending on what, again, what budget and if the board expects something else, a more stretch goal, but yeah, it's, yeah, for us, it's really more kind of a, a, a ratio and just in following what's existing. And we do, we do try to push ourselves and, and get more growth, but, but yeah, I, I, we've never attached a percentage to it. Oh, perfect. Yeah, it's everyone's been extremely helpful with these questions. I love it. My only other one was about when you're evaluating groups that are active versus inactive. And Madeline, maybe this is something that is part of your program as well. Do you ever, if a group, if a user group is not active for a certain period of time, whether it be maybe six months or a year, when you do reach out to them to hear about what their challenges are, are you also saying, hey, we haven't seen that you're active in a year. Do you want to go ahead and are you still interested in being a user? Do you have a process for evaluating, maybe sunsetting that group 
if they are no longer going to be active? Yes, definitely. So how we define like an active chapter director is we have our chapters broken up under three different classification types. So we have a classic chapter, which is the city has a population greater than 300,000. We have an X for if it's less than that. And then we have a U chapter for if it's a university uh, type. And they each have different goals for how many events and like minimum event requirements for the year. And that's what uh, we measure. If a chapter goes more than 90 days without hosting, we then consider it an inactive chapter. And that's the first like pinpoint of when we typically reach out and they will then go underneath like review for a month. And so during that review, they have one month to put a plan in place for how they are going to get active again, if that's something that they desire. With that plan, we encourage them to schedule a call with us. We're gonna help and support them through putting that strategy in place. What is stopping you from hosting an event every month or every other month, whatever it may be. And we help support them that way. Then with the cohort training and like that community program, um, actually go back to that. Once they go underneath the review period at the end of that month period, depending on where they're at, we'll then decide if we, if the chapter is going to be active and then they just keep on moving forward or they end up not meeting those requirements. And it depends on the situation. We're fairly flexible with it because these are volunteers, but depending on the situation, either we'll then just offboard the chapter and we'll make them like completely inactive or we'll put some sort of plan in place for maybe for them to find some more support team to help out or whatever the challenges uh, may be. And then for like specific community programs, because it's only six weeks long and we, one of the reasons why we have this this cohort training, like at the end, they become a certified chapter director and receive the chapter license to, to start hosting. But we put in like a ton of communication and parameters. So then that way they're really following through. And if they're actually serious about being a chapter director and a part of our community, then we're really able to gauge that in the first six weeks and support them on those weekly calls and our follow-up emails, et cetera. Well, that's that that, that's yes, that's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Madeline. And I also have to say that Elijah commented that he wants to see the reactivation recipe. And I think everyone, because it's I think so uncomfortable, like asking a volunteer, mm, well, you didn't make any uh, meetups in the last three months. What, what's going on? So I have my uh, text, but I feel uh, uncomfortable every time doing this. You don't have to share now, but if anyone, anyone has like a good recipe for this, we would really like to hear it. Going for next question. And that was what it was. Okay, so I think maybe it's the same question, Mariah, uh, about, if you want to ask it, uh, handle the groups that fall short for their goals. I think uh, Madeline answered it with okay. um, with the 90 days yeah. uh, inactivity and then how do you go from there? So I think my question was answered. Impressive, by the way. <laughs> I have my six months, the threshold for considering it inactive for six months. And as Telly says, that approach then is, oh God, let's see how <laughs> they take it. So thank you. For, for us, and because it definitely is un, can be an uncomfortable conversation and even more so with everything that's going on with COVID and especially like some of our chapters, they're just experiencing like crazy stuff in their cities and it's completely insensitive for us to be like, hey, why aren't you hosting your event when your entire world is falling apart? So we definitely do give some leeway to certain chapters, but even then we're very communicative about specific deadlines because we're all human and it's so easy to be like, oh, maybe next month. And oh no, like the speaker canceled and maybe next month. And so when we have those deadlines, it really helps our chapter directors like stay accountable for that. And then 
now with us doing these one-on-one check-ins, we're taking such more of like an individualistic approach to being like, hey, what are the actual pain points going on? I'm sorry, you're going through this tough time. You're having trouble finding speakers. Like I'm pulling up LinkedIn right now. Let me see who we can find. Oh, we have a speaker database. And so being, we're getting to that level right now where we're being very specific with our support. And it's been awesome because we started really doing that At the end of the year, we always do like a chapter cleanup and see where everyone's at to see if they're ready to start the new year with us. And so this new year, uh, like we've already seen our event numbers go up. We hit over the hundred mark for our chapter check-in for the month. So it seems like it's working right now with this individualistic approach of really addressing what's the pinpoint issue of like why you're not hosting. And sometimes they come back and they're like, you know what? Like, I just realized I really don't have time for this. Thank you so much, et cetera. So, yeah. And thank you. Another bit general question, a question, how do you manage um, the management request for like setting goals? If they want the goal to be a bit different from what as a community manager, for example, engagement versus growth or similar, or I, um, eye to eye with your like higher management. To me? Okay. So for me at the moment, for our current stage uh, in the community, we pay more attention to the engagement level of metrics, to the level of conversations, because it's, it's maybe that was like a challenge for me to grow for this year, for the past year, for, for example, we had the goal to achieve uh, 100,000 community members and I, I, I was and, and usually two years ago we had the growth around maybe 3,000 per year and this goal was set to myself like two years ago and we had around 70,000 members and for me for that time I had 3,000 year growth and within two years I will need to get th- uh, 30,000 and that was a great challenge for me to identify what we can do increase these numbers and last year we've got more than 10,000 members registered to the community so 3,000 comparison to 10,000 within a year and it's like for me that was okay I can do this that's that's done and that's why at the moment for us it is mostly interesting to and for the company for sure it's mostly interesting to increase the level of conversation between the community members so we still expect the high growth of the new members but at the same time we need to like connect people find the touch for them why they join the community and uh, what they can do with the community to get the benefits of it thank you cool and then from my perspective so again we're much more at the beginning of this journey compared to tanya and madeline but i have had to push back on my executives when they want to set like a really crazy stretch goal and this ways i found to do that effectively i don't want to sandbag anybody i want it to be like realistic goals but i'm able to come back and say okay we really want to double our membership it's going to probably cost this much. We're going to need um, X amount of hours from our digital uh, programmatic advertising people to help boost it that way. I'll need to be able to have X, Y, Z amount of time to do promotions as well. So I'm able to if put it in terms of like people hours and the resources I would need from the rest of the team. And then it usually helps them kind of really understand how much work actually goes into hitting various goals. So, so that's what I've done. Thank you. We are up at the time is over and shocked. Okay, so um, I just wanted him to ask the last question. Uh, so we'll take one last question and then we will be uh, end for today. To thank everyone for joining. Um, so the last question will be, um, okay. So what is your one tip to set goals for your chapter program? Or the, the one important thing that you want to learn and you want to share with everyone else. That's tough. I think for me, it's always coming back to why we created the community in the first place. And for us, that was meant to be uh, like a professional resource. So setting goals always with that in mind and how can our goals help the members in that way like just aligning north star thank you yeah i would say kind of like the same thing for us is like 
remembering that there is like a human at the end of that metric and that number and that goal. And especially with volunteers, that's why we have those, okay, this is our goal, but here's our stretch goal of where we really want to be. But also we're in the middle of a global pandemic. So it's okay if we hit that number too. Yeah, for us, human relationship, it's also very important. Uh, but at the same time, we are, it's one of the, it's the path from one of our SEO. He liked the math and the data. And that's why we measured a lot in, the, in, in this, in, in, at, at Smart Bear and in the community. We always try to identify some correlation with the numbers. For example, I know how many as an example, customers we have in this region, right? How many of them may be active enough to set up Meetup? How many we would like to have? How many we can work on because of also we also have some limited resources, right? And we need to think about this as well. But I am always uh, trying to find some data and some numbers that I will need to at least try to achieve. Thank you very much. Great event.